Okay, Salaam alaikum to Lai Barakatu, everyone. Welcome to Mind Heist episode 79. Uh, this is a different episode. We've got a guest on today. Um, I'm honestly excited because I think most of the guests we had are people like I know, like very personally, like friends or whatever. So this might be the first guest we have that, you know, we just communicated for the first time like a week ago, a few days ago. Um, and the topic is something really, really interesting, something that you probably wouldn't hear on other podcasts, to be honest. Um, and it's something I think is very important for Muslims to hear about, um, especially if you're living, Yani, I, I really, anyone, any, no matter where you're living because of the, the globalized nature of the world, right? So to get into the topic, I'll ask my guest today, Sharif, to introduce yourself a little bit and uh, with your introduction, tell me about what your average day looks like and that will kind of uh, set the tone. Okay, well, my name is Sharif Abdul Uh I'm an American. And currently I live in New Mexico. And I guess what makes me different is that I live off grid. Mm -hmm. I'm a homesteader. Mm -hmm. So I have a 51 uh, acre uh, homestead, which is I believe in hectares about 20, yeah, about 20 hectares. Mm -hmm. um, to put that into perspective, 51 acres is the same size as 51 football pitches. So um, that's how much land I have. Wow. Um, okay, so what does your the average day look like, Shari? Well, my day begins right now um, at about 4.15. Mm -hmm. The alarm goes off, uh, Fudger prayer. Uh, so get up for Fudger, uh, get ready, pray and everything. And then I actually start teaching online because I'm an online teacher as well. And I start teaching... Uh, at six o'clock. Um, depending on what time of the year it is, my schedule will change a bit. Um, but to answer your question, I'm going to actually include what other members of my household are doing at the same time. Okay. To good, get yeah. a more complete, complete uh, picture. So we'll get up, we'll pray Fudger and everything. And then usually um, right before the sun comes up, my daughters will go out to milk the cows. Mm -hmm. So we have uh, dairy cows. We have actually Jersey cows. Mm. Um, and they walk over to the cows pasture. Um, we have a separate field for them. We call it triangle field. Mm. And they go over there, gather the cows and start milking. Mm. At that same time, I'm usually coming up to start, you mm. know, teaching online. Mm. Oh, <laughs> I didn't explain this to you. So my house is in one location. Right. And 200 meters, 600 feet away, I have a shipping container mm. that I converted into an office. Oh. Um, that's, that's where I'm at actually right now. Mm. Um, so I have uh, solar panels to generate electricity. Mm -hmm. um, I also have a uh, fiber line for my internet. Mm -hmm. um, so and with, mm -hmm. and uh, with the solar panels, um, so there's wires that come in. I have a battery bank that's over here to the left of me. Yeah. I have an inverter that converts the DC current, direct current to alternating mm. current. Yeah. And what that means is the current that you use in your house. Yeah. Yeah. Um, and I just plug in my laptop mm. and, uh, my lights, my fan, whatever I need. Right. Right. Um, so, so you said your, your, do you say your kids or who goes to milk the cows? Uh, two of my daughters. So I have a daughter yeah. that okay. is, uh, uh, 14 and one mm. at 16. Okay. Uh, they'll, they'll go milk the cows. Right. Um, while I start teaching. Yeah. Um, then they'll get the milk, they'll come back and they will strain the milk and cool it. Mm, mm, mm. And then Great. we just refrigerate it. Um, yeah. milk, milk is best. Fresh milk is best. Yeah. After it's been cooled for at least 24 hours. Okay. Why it's, is that? It's, just it becomes sweet. Mm. It becomes sweeter. Ah, oh, really? Okay, right. Yeah. And the it, the sweetness in milk is like lactose, right? Lactose is actually a um, a sugar, isn't it? Yes. Yeah. I yeah. think about that for got me the science question. <laughs> <laughs> okay. So so Sharif uh, Muhammad, salamikum by the way. Um, uh, so Sharif, meet Muhammad. <laughs> Hello, Muhammad. How are you doing? <laughs> so Muhammad just came a bit late. Um, 
So yeah, Muhammad, by the way, yeah, I don't want it to be like just me asking all the questions. So whenever you want to, you know, you got curious, then just ask, because I got, I got all my questions ready. Um, so Sharif, like you said, you're, you're a homesteader. What is that? Yes. Because I've heard of the word, but I don't actually know what it is. Well, the, the definition is varied. The original homesteaders were the people who basically left the city, say, in eastern United States, mm. for my particular example, and they would move west to mm. uh, land that was open. Mm -hmm. And the government at one time was giving people 120 acres for free mm. if you could live on the land for five years, build a house that was uh, at least 12 feet by 16 feet, and make improvements on the land. Mm. Uh, the United States government stopped this program, uh, I believe, in 1982. Okay. Was, but many people didn't know about it. Uh, mm -hmm. Unfortunately, if, if I'd have known about it, I'd have <laughs> went out way earlier, but I had to pay for, for my land. Mm -hmm. um, so a homesteader is a person who basically is trying to carve out their section uh, in the world by living off the land as much as possible. Mm. Uh, generating their own power as much as possible, mm. um, just being self-sufficient right. as much as possible because there's different levels. Mm -hmm. mm. And uh, like, so going back to like, I guess where you started in life, I guess, because like, obviously you go through a journey to get to where you are. So you said, uh, where'd you grow up and was it like a rural environment or urban environment? What was that like? Okay. Well, I grew up in Pennsylvania, so mm. I was born Pennsylvania, mm. which is uh, a city, um, but I was just born there, but I was mm. raised in Ackland, Pennsylvania, which mm. is right on the border with the Amish community. Mm. So the Amish, I don't know mm. if you're familiar yeah, with them, they're, they're Anabaptist and um, they're originally from like Germany mm. and they left Europe because of religious persecution. Yeah. And um, today they live the same way they did pretty much hundreds of years ago. They yeah. ride in horse and buggies. The men have long beards because that's a symbol that they're married. Oh. The women wear dresses and cover their hair. Mm. Um, so I grew up in that area for the first six years of my life. Uh, oh. Then we moved to the suburbs mm -hmm. and uh, we had a, a house, mm. a ranch house, so one level, one floor, uh, and an acre of a half of land with woods in the back and a uh, a creek that ran, you know, uh, through the yard. Mm. I lived there until I was 16. Mm. Then I lived actually in the city for two years before I went into the Marine Corps. Right. So, so it was kind of rural setting, yeah? Yeah, it was suburban rural. I mean, yeah. every summer I would go back because my grandmother lived in the country. So I would yeah. spend the summers there with my cousins and we would just yeah. play games in the cornfields and just act mm. crazy. Mm. But did you do like farm work at all? We did growing, but not mm. an actual farm. It was just, uh, you know, a family garden, mm. you know. Mm. Mm. Okay. Just and like then, that. so what, like you, then you went to Saudi Arabia at some, po some point, right? So what was like your journey to get there? Okay. So to get to Saudi Arabia, it's... Uh, so back in 2002, mm. I, got, I got remarried. Mm. And uh, the sister, you know, she was from the UK, mm. but she was working in Bahrain mm. for, that, for the past 16 years mm. in Islamic banking. Mm. Uh, so when we got married, I said, if there's a way that I can get you back to the Middle East, because mm. she really liked it there, mm. I said, that's what I'll do. Mm. Um, so I went back to school. Um, got my bachelor's degree in English literature, then my master's degree in education, mm. and then along with a TEFL certificate, mm. and decided to teach in Saudi Arabia mm. from 2000, starting in 2009, and I stayed for six years. Mm. Mm. So what about, like, does, you know, the fact that you're obviously living in a rural environment now, would you say there's any link between, like, your upbringing and also maybe even going into the uh, army, right? Or is it the Marines is a separate thing, I guess? Marine Corps, um, is, is, Marine Corps. Okay. Is that like a, a bad don't thing? You got, 
you got the British Royal Marines, right? Yeah, yeah. I, I don't even know much about the UK side yeah. of things. I don't so, know the yeah. difference either, man. <laughs> oh my goodness! So, sorry, dude. <laughs> it's like it's like the elite. The British Mar Royal Marines are the elite force, and the right. American Marines are an elite force. Right. Got okay. it. Yeah, yeah. Sorry. And okay, so that is a big difference. Yes, the army's just rubbish. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> he said rubbish as well with the British. <laughs> okay, so so did that like set you up for what you're doing now? Do you think? Um, to be honest, when I tell people what really prepared me for living this lifestyle, they, I mean, yeah. people laugh, they can't believe it. Yeah. Um, so what we did is we, we traveled around to different places to study. So, um, for example, um, uh, in the UK, there's a place where they teach natural building. Mm. Okay. So that's, um, was it Yarmouth? Right, Yarmouth? Okay. Yes. Mm. So we went there and we learned cob building, how to build houses mm. using natural materials, which mm. is clay, straw, sand, water, small rocks, mixing them together mm. and building a house. Mm. Um, traditional houses, like old houses in Devonshire, yeah. are still standing that are this structure. Mm. Uh, Timbuktu. I was just remote. thinking of Timbuktu, you know, that those structures are still there, yeah. Yes. So this building yeah. material is seismic proof, rodent proof. Um, it's, it lasts, you know, pretty much for forever. And mm. basically the building material of the world until the industrial revolution. Mm. So we went there to learn how to build. Um, I went to the, the yurt farm in Wales mm. to look at other ways of uh, living off grid, sustainable things. Mm. Um, I went to, to Scotland for some study. Mm. I did some study in the United States. Um, and then lots of books mm. and YouTube. Mm. Yeah, YouTube yeah. was like my friend. I learned so much on YouTube mm. that it's insane. The local people where mm. I live now actually ask for my advice on issues. Yeah. And they've been doing this for generations. Wow. Yeah. Mm. So mm. YouTube is like up notch. Mm. So you're like borrowing experience from, I guess on YouTube, we find maybe the best and you're able to just borrow that experience from the best directly rather than having to learn it generation to generation mm. kind of thing. That's crazy. Yes. So what, what led you to choose, you know, to, 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 to change this lifestyle? Was it because, you know, with, with the, the kind of way you're living, what I assume now, I could be wrong. What I assume is, you know, uh, people that choose to start living off grid, either they're, they're sick of the city life, um, they want something closer to nature, they recognize as something uh, more wholesome, better, whether it's physically, whether it's spiritually in living off grid. Um, some people, they don't want to live the rat race. So they want to live in a way where they don't need um, so much income in order to just live and all of that. So what was your reason, you know, for doing this? Well, pretty much all of those. Um, mm. One, because of my upbringing, I love out the outdoors. Okay. I good. mean, it's just it's just great. I mean, running around trees, rivers, lakes. Yeah. Um, in the middle of the night, you know, we catch lightning bugs when I was a kid. Mm. Uh, and this is something I wanted to do, and I wanted land. Yeah. However, in Pennsylvania, where I live, land is very expensive. Mm. Uh, so I had to look at other places. Mm. Um, later on, we thought about going out West. Mm -hmm. So New Mexico, the land is cheap, mm. extremely cheap. Mm. When I tell you this, man, you're going to, you might pass mm. out. <laughs> so I told you that I have, uh, 51 acres. Yeah. So 51 acres cost me $19,000. Whoa. Okay. And remind, remind me what 51 acres is like in terms of like football pitch. So, or the size of a football pitch. So it's like 51 football fields for $20,000. Mm -hmm. Yeah, basically. Yes. So one football field was basically $372. Wow. And it, this land, is it like, because when, when you say uh, New Mexico, I think of desert, but what is the uh, land like? Oh, that's another thing too. So where I live, I live in the high plains grasslands. 
So mm -hmm. my elevation is uh, 6,000 feet, 2,000 meters above sea level. Right. Uh, so the air is thinner for one, mm. um, which makes your lungs stronger. So when yeah. I go to sea level, yeah. I feel like a superhero. Mm -hmm. um, mm. But this is cattle country, so it's all open. Mm. Um, there used to be fruit plantations here. Uh, there are a lot of cattle farmers, uh, mm. sheep herders. Okay. Um, and it's not a desert. We, we have a mild climate. So even in the winter, um, I'm actually able to go outside in a t-shirt. Wow. Great. Um, we, we do get snow. Yeah. But it, it'll come and it, I'm serious. it will be here for maybe a couple hours and then it melts. Right. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Okay. So what, what's it? good for grow what's good for growing over there then because obviously there's different types of soil uh, and mm -hmm. stuff like that well where we are there mm. are different hardiness zones okay and so we're hardiness zone six right uh hardiness zone six is the same hardiness zone i had in pennsylvania you mm. can pretty much grow everything mm. except citrus so okay. we can grow potatoes corn mm. Uh, beans, carrots, uh, cucumbers, squash, mm. cantaloupe, strawberries, mm. um, cherries, apples, plums, apricots, nectarines, mm. pistachios, um, everything. Mm. <laughs> with, with or without like, uh, you know, tons of fertilizer? Oh, no, we don't use uh, fertilizer. We're natural. So you so use the cow's we, uh, manure? Yes. So we use cow manure, sheep manure. And we use uh, rabbit manure. Rabbit manure is super powerful mm. and it makes things grow like mm. crazy. Do you eat the rabbits as well? Uh, yes, we don't. We had rabbits. We don't have them anymore. Because mm, um, they went in your belly. <laughs> <laughs> well, actually, I, I prefer chicken. My yeah. daughter's preferred rabbit. Oh. Um, but that takes me to the thing of mm. when raising rabbits, mm. um, their environment needs to be controlled mm -hmm. temperature wise. So in the winter, uh, the temperature went down a little bit too much when they were having babies and we lost a lot of the babies. Right. Mm. Um, so I needed to have a better structure mm -hmm. uh, in place. And at the time I'm like, I'm not doing that right now. Mm. So we just got mm. rid of the rabbits. Mm. Okay. We, I'm not, I'm <laughs> Alhamdulillah. Why not? I've had rabbit, I think, only once, but it, it mm. was good. I mean, similar to chicken. Um, I, I'm, I'm getting ahead of myself, Sharif. Yeah. So uh, tell me about, you know, obviously you're Muslim and I, I'm sure you're, you're committed to trying to be the best Muslim, inshallah. May Allah accept everything from you. What do you um, think is the element of you know, the Dini side of things that pushed you to, to live out there, you know, in a rural environment? Well, um, actually, we, we have a blog. Mm -hmm. And the, the blog tells you, says, you know, a family's journey to escape the fitna mm -hmm. of the, the world and to mm -hmm. live a life where you can truly practice Islam. Mm -hmm. And where we are, we have no real distractions. Mm -hmm. um, and... You know, some people might not like what I'm about to say, but I don't really care because this is my experience. Mm -hmm. I have less distractions here mm -hmm. compared to when I lived in Medina. Mm. Okay. And living in Medina, you have cars, you have people, you have five guys. All kinds of all kinds of stuff going on. <laughs> yeah. Uh but I live in a very rural area. Yeah. So in my county, the mm. whole county, mm. we have 600 people. Mm. Yeah. Uh, for me to go to the store, like yeah. Walmart, you know, yeah. a department store, for those that don't know what Walmart is, think of Tesco. Yeah. Okay. So it is uh, one hour and 15 minutes away to drive one way. Okay. Yeah. Okay. Wow. <laughs> Sick. That's uh. <laughs> <laughs> um, yeah, I get what you're saying, Sharif, actually, like probably Medina has certain elements. Of course you don't have, right? You have, of course, of course Nebawi, yes. it has those things, yeah. but what you're saying is that the distraction is also multiplied a lot to the point where, mm. you know, I don't, I don't want to be the one to say it outweighs, but 
I get, I get what you're saying. Yeah. yeah. You if, I was, if I was sitting in the harem all day, yeah. then that would be different. But you yeah. know, you go to mm. the harem for a bit and then you leave. Mm. And once you leave, then all of the worldly things are like bam in your face. Yeah. Do you yeah, think? Yeah. Do you think that coming from a sort of a, a lifestyle that that requires you to rely on what you're what you're planting yourself or what you're growing yourself, does that sort of put you into a better connection with Allah Subhanahu Wa Taala? Because sometimes here, like you might get you know docked a bit in your pay or something doesn't go the way you want it to go, and you you fall into blaming people. Or, or do you know what I mean? Relying on people more, relying on your boss to pay you, or relying on, I don't know, the, the certain aspects of of society, for example, to f- to fund your family or to fuel your family, as opposed to when you're out there, sort of doing it, like relying on weather to be good so your crops can grow, or your animals not to get sick, or you know what I mean, no pests to come and ruin your crops. Like, I feel like in that environment, I would be more connected to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala because the only person or the only being or the only thing that I can link to those causalities is Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala directly. Mm. Do you understand? Do you, do you think that, oh. that the connection is a lot deeper that way? Most definitely. I mean, um, so where we live, we're in the high plains grasslands, but we're semi-arid. Mm. So if it doesn't rain, we got some serious issues. We, we pray for rain. Yeah. Mm. You know, uh, mm. We see that, and actually, uh, when we first came here, mm. um, they had a drought for like, mm. pff, man, a couple years. Mm. So we went to the rodeo, and there was a lady that we met there. We were sitting in the bleachers because we thought it was important that people see us and interact with us. Um, and she was, she turned around. She says, "I don't know who you are, but my daughter calls you the people who brought the rain." Because Alhamdulillah, when we came, it started raining. Alhamdulillah. Okay. Wow. So man. we were like, you know, we got to do stuff right here because, yeah. you know, we don't want the wrath of Allah to come down on us, you know, because we started acting up or something. Yeah. Mm. But uh, yeah, I mean, we've had uh, situations with the with the animals mm. uh, where, you know, like, okay, if it doesn't rain, the grass isn't going to grow and we have to buy hay. And then when you're milking the cow, the milk tastes different from hay compared to fresh grass. Mm. Uh, the butter changes in color wow. and in taste. Wow. Uh, the eggs that the chickens produce, they are different. Mm-hmm. So, you know, we pray and, you know, my kids, we instill in them that these things are important, that, you know, you got to rely on Allah because without Allah, we're just nothing. <clears throat> Nothing's yeah. going to grow. Mm. We're going to have no success. And we, we've been tested. Uh, so we have a uh, shipping container masjid on the property, okay. okay, which is open to the whole community. And uh, when they placed it, it was off Qibla just a little bit. Mm. And I was like, no, it's got to be perfect. Yeah. So uh, I hooked up my wife's truck. <laughs> my wife's truck. <laughs> Not mine. Uh, I hooked I chains that. to it to, to move it. Now she had a Ford excursion, which is a V10 engine, which mm. can pull like mm. anything. Mm. And uh, the kids were in there like, daddy, daddy, we want to be in there with you. Mm. So we're in there and I'm trying to pull it and I see the tires are spinning yeah. and I see like all this dust. Mm. I thought it was dust. Mm. It was smoke. The oh. tires were spinning so fast that they were igniting the grass. Oh. Wow. And then uh, we had a fire. It just mm. came up. Mm. So the back end where the, the masjid where I was pulling was on fire. Mm. So I had to back up a bit so the chain, I could release the chains. I told the kids to get out. They couldn't get out because of safety locks. Mm. So I had to jump out, run, open a door. Mm. My son was two. I actually like threw him like poof mm. to, to his sisters like, take him, run. Because I've seen all these movies, like, <laughs> stuff blowing up. Yeah. Uh, yeah. But this is real wife, life, yeah. Yeah. My wife went back with my truck <laughs> mm. to get the fire extinguishers and stuff. Mm. And I, I pulled up a little bit further. Fire was coming through the floorboards at my feet. Mm. And then uh, it must have hit something, and then the, the truck stopped. It couldn't go anymore. <clears throat> and then I got out, and everything just uh 
burned up. My mm. my tablet, uh, $600 worth of chicken feed, um, my kids and my wife's British passports. Um, oh, and when she came back, she had an extinguisher and it was just, <laughs> everything was gone. Mm. And I'm like, no, no, <laughs> no. And I was so mad. And my wife was like, alhamdulillah. <laughs> and I was like, what? She's like, alhamdulillah, Allah has decreed that we don't need this. Yeah. And I, was, I mean, alhamdulillah, she's a great reminder. It took her to remind me that, you know, although I paid money for it, it's not mine. I didn't do anything. Yeah. You know, mm -hmm. this was, you know, from Allah. He's allowed me to work to get money to do this, but you got to show gratitude and if mm. not, he'll take it away from you. Mm. What, what about the truck? Was that okay in the end? Uh, it it burned. Oh, uh, the truck burned as well. Wow. To, mm. to oh, no, my truck was okay. Yeah, <laughs> of course it was. <laughs> <laughs> that was far away. <laughs> but but my wife's truck was destroyed. Wow. Um, it was just, it just was a shell. There was nothing left. The fire so that's company. Thousands came. of dollars of uh, maybe more than not tens of thousands of dollars of stuff. Well, no, actually. Uh, I actually got a, a really good deal on her truck. I mean, it. it Your it, wife's it truck got a good deal. <laughs> yeah, it looked brand new, yeah. and um, uh, it had super low mileage. Mm. And the person we bought it from was actually in a financial bind. You know, mm. they needed money, and they were willing to let it go super cheap. I mean, right, alhamdulillah. Mm. So that's so, another alhamdulillah, I suppose, that it could have been a lot more lost there um, boy, monetarily. So, yes. so what kind of, did you go like from, were you, were you in Medina, by the way, uh, when you're in Saudi? Yes, yes I was did in you, Medina. Did you study with the Mufti at all? Um, I, not, not exact. I mean, I know Mufti, I've been to some of his uh, classes and everything. Yeah. But I didn't actually study with him. Yeah. Uh, I was in, I shared an office yeah. with Sheikh Tahir Wyatt. We mm. were together mm. uh, and our daughters are friends. Um and also his reader, uh, Rashid Ahmadi. Um, alhamdulillah, there was uh, a lot of students that are there. Mm -hmm. uh, Always Sunworthy, mm -hmm. uh, referred to, they call him Always Tawil from the UK. Yeah. Um, so there were a lot of different brothers that were uh, at Taiba University. Mm. And uh, also Mufti's from, is he from uh, Philadelphia, right? Yes, yes, yes. So, you got that connection as well. Cool. So when you, did you like leave Medina and go straight to New Mexico or you first went somewhere else or what was that? Uh, so what we did is when I was in Medina, um, mm. we purchased the land while I was in Medina. I yeah. went on to Google Earth. Mm. I zoomed in. I did a whole lot of internet research and then we purchased the land. So what we would do is during the summer, we would come back for our, you know, our holiday mm. um, and try to get something accomplished mm. and then come back to Saudi, go back the next summer. Right. And we did this for a couple of years. Mm. Um, but when we moved to South, uh, excuse me, to New Mexico. And once again, you know, I tell other people who try to do this, you know, you don't have to do it like I did it, you know, mm. go at your own pace, do what you can do uh, because we lived in tents. Mm, uh, at the beginning mm. yes we lived in tents so we had these tents kodiak canvas tents um mm. they're like 12 feet by 16 feet so we had uh, a tent for the girls and then uh, a masala tent and then you know a bathroom tent and then mm. a kitchen tent mm. we lived in there um and then we upgraded to a travel trailer mm. um you guys i believe in the uk call them caravans Right. Yeah. So mm. we upgraded to that. Mm. And then we got multiple caravans mm. and then uh, we upgraded to a, uh, a mobile home, mm. which is a three bedroom, a uh, thousand square feet mobile home. Mm. Uh, presently, we're still in it. Mm. Um, and I'm working on building a shipping container house. I'm taking seven shipping containers to build a house. Mm. And how many kids did you have when you w went over there? When I went to Saudi? No, no. When you when you went to New Mexico for the you know first time uh, beginning. Mm. When I when I came here, uh, four. four. So my oldest mm. my oldest daughter 
she had gotten married, she left home, but so, I have three children with me. Uh, right. Okay. So you're going, uh, what were their ages? Uh, so we got here five years ago. Yeah. <laughs> Man, now you're going to make me do math? Come on. <laughs> <laughs> so, how, how old are they now then? Let's say that. Instead. We'll do the math. <laughs> <laughs> Alhamdulillah, Muhammad, Alhamdulillah. Thank you. Thank you. It's okay. So my, my oldest daughter uh, that's here now, she's 16, about to turn 17. Mm. My other daughter just turned 14 in May, and my son is seven and a half. Right. So like three to 11 years old. So that's like taking a three-year-old out there, you know, it's brand new for you. That's kind of a, what was, well, how did you feel? Were you like scared, worried or excited or like, what was the feeling? I was excited. Mm. Uh, we weren't really worried because mm -hmm. um, we did a lot of study prior to coming out here um, and we would come back for the summers. Um, and I've been taking my, for example, I've been taking my kids camping um, from like day one. Okay. Um, so before they could walk, they've been camping. Mm, mm. Um, and we would go camping uh, every month, regardless of the weather. So they've been camping in pouring rain, mm. in the snow, mm. in the intense heat. So being outdoors is like normal for them. Amazing. Very good. Um, so yeah, it wasn't uh, something scary or whatever. It was just a lot of work. And mm -hmm. um, I had to find ways to keep the kids entertained because they're not going to work all the time. Mm -hmm. So, you know, I put in like a balance beam, a swing set. Um, we had a seesaw going on. Mm. Uh, Lots of space uh, for all that stuff. Mm. Oh, yeah. And then alhamdulillah, the, the grandfather mm. uh, for the Eid, he mm. bought them uh, motorcycles. No. So, so, so the girls are the girls are like nya, 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 just <laughs> riding around. Mashallah. <laughs> so your your oldest daughter, what point did she leave the house? Was it before or after you came to New Mexico? Oh after. After we oh, after. And in terms of I mean, I don't know if you want to talk about it a bit, but in terms of that whole process of being uh, you know, happy with whoever she married and stuff, uh, did her husband come from a very different background or was that like a bit of a sort of a new thing for them or are they familiar with that kind of lifestyle that you raised your kids upon? Uh, no, well, the, the family, I've known them for years. Oh, okay. All right. Okay. So the, they're reverts like me. Um, and the, the background is very sim uh, similar. Okay. So this old, this older daughter that got married, mm -hmm. um, cause I was married before her mother is Puerto Rican. Okay. So, and the family that she married uh, to, they're Puerto Rican. Oh, so, I see. Okay. Uh, so we had the ethnic connection, the family connection. Um, I've known the family for, for years. I mean, uh, and the kids, they knew each other too. Alhamdulillah. Okay, mm. then. Very good. Yeah, yeah. Now, what about uh, your, say, your parents or brothers, sisters? Like, what was their opinion of you moving out there um well my mom just she knows i'm crazy pretty much <laughs> uh nobody ever expects me to be home for like long everybody's like i'm somewhere for two years and i go somewhere else two years okay. i'm somewhere else mm. um so i'm always moving but uh alhamdulillah i actually convinced them to move out here oh um, so great. so my mom moved out here my sister my mm. aunt my nephew yeah, yeah. Uh, my father's deceased but um so we got everybody to move out i'm still trying to get more relatives to yeah. move out here yeah so uh do they live i guess they don't live in the mobile home right because that's not enough space they have their own um kind of setup right yeah they actually live in town there's a little village right that's um five minutes away from me okay um like my mom said she goes look i already lived that life for like uh <laughs> as a child growing up i'm not yeah. doing that again yeah, <laughs> so I yeah. Said, like i said okay mom yeah but um it actually allowed them to uh to actually live life mm. my my sister uh who's not muslim who was living in pennsylvania and she had a mortgage and the the mortgage payment was real high and then something happened and she fell behind in the mortgage and she's always trying to catch up. And I'm like, Monica, just sell it. Get out of it. She goes, no. She's like, 
this is all I got. I'm like, start over, just get rid of it. Mm. So alhamdulillah, she, she listened and she got a small place and there's another shocker for you. So she has a, uh, a two bedroom mobile home in town and she has uh, five lots, which is about uh, a quarter acre of land mm -hmm. uh, for $5,000. <laughs> right. Wow. So now she's able to live. I mean, she has money where she's able actually to travel to go on vacation and do whatever she wants. Yeah. Compared to working and just paying and for a house that you know. Yeah. yeah. Forever. Yeah. My yeah. mom is retired. My aunt's retired, so they bought property out here too. Mm. So everybody's just. Mm. It's a relaxing lifestyle for everyone. Mm. Mm. Alhamdulillah. So Sharif, like. Of course, you were in Saudi. Um, I don't know if you ever you've been to other Muslim countries or you lived in others. But um, why yes, why pick America then? Well, I I lived in uh, Syria. Mm -hmm. Well, let me go back. The first Muslim country that I went to was Egypt. Okay. Uh, and I loved Egypt, but mm. my ex-wife uh, didn't like it, and I had promised her when we went that if she didn't like it, then. I would bring her back. So we came back to America. Mm. Later on, I went and I lived in Syria. Mm. Uh, lived in Syria for a year, um, then went back to the state. Mm. Um, just still looking for like the right place. Um, went to Saudi, and if I could homestead in Saudi, I probably you know would have taken the steps necessary. But there's no path to citizenship, so mm. that's not realistic for me. Mm. Um, I thought about the UK being that my wife is British and my kids are dual nationals and I can stay mm. and, you know, become a citizen, but land in the UK is very expensive. Mm. Mm. So stick to what I know. I know America mm. and I know that the land is cheap. Mm. So there were, you know, opportunities, uh, to get land here. Mm. Okay. Mm. Makes sense. I suppose, I guess the, for other people where there is, like you said, opportunity for maybe for citizenship or some people already have citizenship, you know, like okay. I have citizenship, Algeria, Mohammed has citizenship of Tunisia and Morocco, right? Just Tunisia. Tunisia. Yeah. So oh, I've um, been there. I've been there. I was part of my journeys too. I didn't, I it was, I was there for a little bit. I'll yeah. tell you that story in a minute. <laughs> <laughs> tell it, tell it now, Sharif. Go, Go on, on. Man. <laughs> Oh man. So, Probably um, negative, huh? <laughs> so, it was, it was a, a different experience, mm. you know? So I was coming from Italy. Uh, I came on boat to mm. Tunis. Mm -hmm. So, uh, you know, I, I arrived there and it was just, it was, it was sad in a way mm. because, you know, I got, I have a thobe on, my wife is covered, everybody, you know, happy. And it was like, boom, I got singled out for like extra checks oh. of my bags and mm. everything mm. what year was this? and this was in um 1998 1998 right okay. yeah mm. okay when, so when muhammad was like six <laughs> <laughs> yes <something like> that. <laughs> <laughs> yeah don't make the brother do math come on yeah, man. come on man <laughs> <laughs> so they were going through my bags and they asked me why do you have two Qur'ans? And I'm like, one's mine, one's my wife's, you know? Yeah. Uh, it was just, uh, it was just shocking, you know? Yeah. Um, yeah. The, the love for the West, when you have something beautiful and you want to just go the other way, yeah. you know? Yeah. You can be modern and, you know, have all these technological things, but, you know, to, to compromise the deen is, you know, just, it's not a good thing. No, of course. Yeah, man. Yeah. Yeah. I, I, I hear, I hear like, like kind of like what you're saying, like land in Algeria, I know you can get very cheap and the soil in Algeria is, is really amazing. A lot of the time, like Mediterranean mm. climate is really good for growing mm. stuff. Um, and then I've heard of people like Indonesia as well is a, is yes. a place where obviously rainfall is crazy. I think you can grow anything out there pretty much. Um, so there is options of course, but, I guess you got to find what works for you specifically visa wise and all of that. So, so yeah, yeah. 
Uh, Sharif, what would you say was the all in, all in cost of just getting set up for the first kind of year? I mean, maybe you spread it over a couple of years, right? But any mm -hmm. approximation? Well, it's, it's hard to say because, yeah. uh, I mean, we did keep notes mm -hmm. of, of everything that we bought. Um, so the, the land was uh, 19,000, okay, 20,000, we'll round it off. Yeah. Um, and my land was empty. I mean, there was nothing, no fences, mm. no buildings, mm. nothing here. Mm. Um, so I had some fencing done. Uh, the bit of fencing I had was $3,000 the first year. Mm. And then I had another section, okay, the first year. So $3,000 for that piece of uh, section of fencing. Uh, the tents, each of my tents was like five, six hundred dollars because they're yeah. all season tents. Mm. Um, my truck, I had to get a truck when I initially came back mm. um, to get around. That was like six thousand uh, dollars. Man, well, I'll just tell you this it's not cheap. If people <laughs> think um, going off grid or homesteading or anything like that is cheap. Mm. It's not cheap in the beginning. It's, yeah. There's a lot of costs up front. Yeah. But once you get those things in place, mm. the lifestyle becomes cheap. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So, yeah, it's like so, initial front loading, you know, that's what they call yes. it. Um, uh, and I was going to say, if you, it seemed like, like you were willing to live like uncomfortably at the beginning right with the tents and all of that but if you wanted to spend more you could have gone quicker into living more comfortably right if you wanted to yeah, tents Obviously. are comfortable for me man i'm an american bed dude <laughs> <laughs> yeah you seem to be like, that, like. <laughs> but uh yeah i mean it, it seems rough on the outside mm. but i spend money on things that we've determined that are important yeah. And we're going to be comfortable. We're not going to be miserable. Yeah, yeah. We're not going to have the best, mm. but we're going to be comfortable. Mm. Um, so, mm. yeah. So that's why we had more than one tent. Yeah. Because we didn't all want to be stuffed in. We, I mean, a tent for, this is just for showers and, you know, everything here. This is a tent for praying. Mm. Um, so we're going to have, you know, enough space. Mm. Yes, you can do things very quickly. Mm. And uh people often often ask me like okay you've been there five years now did you do this 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 and this mm -hmm. and i tell them no mm -hmm. and the reason why is because we're not financing you know things yeah uh, i have i have to earn money mm -hmm. and and do stuff so that's why it takes time mm -hmm. um so for example my shipping container house okay uh one shipping container uh, costs uh, $3,250, okay? Um, and that's for them to come and deliver it. And I use, you can't see it now, but I have spray foam insulation on the walls mm. um, that's two inches thick. Mm. This makes a vapor barrier. It, um, it reduces the echo and it's super warm if you put just a small heat source in here mm. and it keeps things cool. Mm. Um, that costs uh, three thousand dollars per container. Mm. Right. right. Okay. Yeah. Mm. Uh, you can't see it, but to the left of me, mm. I have a sliding glass uh, door. Mm -hmm. Okay. So that was uh, four hundred dollars. Mm. Then I had to pay for the wood to stud this stuff, and I do all the work myself. Yeah. yeah. Um, you know, you could contract it out to somebody, and they will do everything for you, mm -hmm. but they'll charge you basically twice as much as it actually cost, maybe yeah. even more. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So, so do actually you think we started a business mm. with this. So mm. my wife and I and the kids, we are homesteading consultants. Okay, yeah, I like that. That's where all the hours of YouTube gets the ROI now, isn't it? Love it. Yes. <laughs> You're the expert, mashallah. So I was gonna ask you, Sharif, like, uh, if you didn't, like you said now, you teach English online, right? If you didn't have mm. that as an option, what would you be doing instead? Because obviously you need to fund these things and stuff. Okay, well, I'm not, I, I do other things too. So uh, I teach online. Mm -hmm. I'm also the county webmaster, the local government. Um, they needed somebody to manage their website. Uh, 
the person doing it before was terrible. I mean, there were all kinds of spelling, punctuation, grammar errors, extra white space, outdated material. Mm. Um, so I bid on the contract in one. Mm. And I've been doing that for the past uh, three years now. Mm. Um, so there's another source of income. Mm -hmm. We also have income from uh, the animals. Mm -hmm. um, so not right now because I actually drive the cows off. Drying a cow off is when you stop milking it um, and it basically, it dries up. The okay. body absorbs the milk back into it. Mm -hmm. Because in, uh, in August, uh, we'll be going to the UK for a month. Right. So, uh, and the cow is pregnant. So the last trimester of pregnancy is when the fetus grows the most. Mm -hmm. So you need all that extra energy and nutrition mm -hmm. going into the fetus, mm -hmm. not into milk production. Mm -hmm. um, when we did uh, milk the cows, we would sell milk locally. Mm. Um, so locally is one price. Yeah. Further out is another price because yeah. that's the market. Um, that's where so you locally, that's where you charge double. <laughs> <laughs> there, there are other people doing it also. You yeah. can't. If I go and undercut those people, man, they'll be upset. Yeah. So our local market is five dollars mm. a gallon. Mm -hmm. Okay. But the farmers market where everybody is mm. and selling their products is ten dollars a gallon. Right. So it, it's double. Yeah, yeah. So, and our milk was better anyway. Um, yeah. Ju not just because if our, there are cows, but uh, have you ever heard of A2, A2 milk? No. No. Okay. Tell me, do you have a problem with drinking milk? Yes. Does it, you do, Mohammed. Okay. Oh, I definitely do. <laughs> now, perfect. Okay. Now, let me tell you this. Uh, people who have any type of African ancestry or Native American ancestry usually have problems digesting milk. Oh, right. Okay. And they think that they're lactose intolerant. Mm, yeah. Okay. Now, some people might be lactose intolerant. I'm not going to say that they're all not. Uh, I thought I was lactose intolerant, but I'm not. Mm. I'm pasteurization intolerant. When they mm. pasteurize the milk, they take out the good bacteria that's in milk. Mm. my body needs that bacteria. Mm. But with my cows, uh, we have raw milk and A2A2 is the original genome for the cows. So there are right. three genomes. There's A2A2, A2A1, A1A1. Mm. A1A1 is the milk that is uh, usually in the stores uh, and usually comes from Holstein cows. Uh, those are the black and white ones. Mm -hmm. uh, their milk they produce twice as much milk as a Jersey cow mm. and it's the water content is higher and the fat content is lower. Okay. Where Jersey yeah. milk has the highest butter fat content. Mm. It's creamier. It's better for making yeah. ice cream, butter, <laughs> yogurt, whatever you want to make. Okay. So, uh, so uh, you, you thought you were allergic, but you won in the end. Okay. And you know, no, I've heard I started about drinking a half a gallon every morning. I need to and try no, that one. No problem. Because mm. if I have milk or any anything like that, it just ruins me. Um, yes. But it, it could I be know. lactose intolerance because when I started having, they, they sell like lacto-free milk. When I started mm -hmm. having that, I was perfectly fine. So I don't now, know. That's the same for me. So I yeah. thought I was lactose intolerant. Right. And then uh, I was in, uh, so my father lives in the Midlands. Mm -hmm. My father-in-law lives in Midlands. Sorry about that. Yeah. Um, so he lives in Colville. Uh, if you're familiar with that area, hmm. yeah, you're like, nah, we don't know Colville. Okay, no, no, I know uh, it's, it's up. Le Lester, Lester, it's up from me. <laughs> okay, um, and there was a, a farm that we went to. I can't remember the name of the farm, mm. but they had raw milk there, mm. and uh, we got raw milk products from them, and it was great. So, mm. yeah, uh, you might want to try that if you do it. I suggest start off with a little bit first. Yeah see how it reacts because if I drink regular milk, I get bloated and yeah, definitely, yeah. it's, it's a bad day. Yeah, mm. it's definitely. <laughs> <laughs> we don't need to say it anymore. It's no, just a bad it. day. That's it. It's a bad day. Is, is raw milk like, because I've never had raw milk, but I've had like camel's milk. Would you say okay. it's similar more like kind of like how camel's milk is kind of creamier kind of, it's a bit bitter as well, actually. Okay, well, what raw milk is, mm. 
It means it came straight from the animal. Yeah, yeah. You just filtered it, mm. but you didn't boil it yeah, yeah. to kill off the bacteria. Mm -hmm. And right. that's the problem. Uh, so so they, the taste is the same it. as what we've got pretty much? Like the yeah, it's, store? It's going to, it's going to, yeah, pretty much, mm. except uh, fresh milk is, is richer and creamier. Yeah, yeah. Uh, for example, I have like a, we would sell it in jars like this big, mm. and one third of the jar would be cream, mm. just naturally. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. But in the stores, what they do is they, they take the cream off yeah. and they use that for other products. We kept the cream with the milk. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, is that what's, that's what skimmed milk is, right? They skim the fat off the top. I, I yes. remember um, Elliot Hulse, he said skimmed milk is basically sugar water. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, pretty. I mean, you're taking out all of that, that goodness. I mean, yeah, it's yeah. just. Yeah. And you know, oh. like. Obviously, they boil the milk, they pasteurize it to kill the harmful bacteria, right? So, mm -hmm. but you would say raw milk is still um, safe if you treat it yes. in the correct way? Now, what, the, what happened was, if you go back in history, and you talk about pasteurization and Louis Pasteur, um, because people were getting sick and they were dying. Mm -hmm. And the standards of hygiene yeah. were the problem, not mm -hmm. the animals. Mm -hmm. People, I mean, it was an, an evil time even the pregnancy and death infant mortality rate was high yeah. because they didn't understand that you can't be working in a field and you can come deliver a baby mm. you can't work in a field and then milk a cow yeah yeah so before you milk a cow you wash your hands yeah uh you wash the cows udders and everything you make sure everything's clean yeah you have a clean environment mm. and you're milking straight into a clean uh stainless steel Mm. Uh, bucket mm. Mm. Uh, and then you take that and then you filter it because mm. you might get some some dust or some hair from the animal into it mm -hmm. uh, and you filter it and it's a, a real fine filter like a, a coffee filter mm. Mm. okay mm. and then uh, you chill the milk and everything is good as long as you take care of your animals mm. um, you have to make sure there's certain uh, diseases that an animal can get, like um, mastitis is one. Um, if you don't milk the cow out completely, then that udder, that, uh, that one section, that teat can get hard. Yeah. And then um, it's like a fever that brews in there, and then there's like bacteria, and you'll get sick. Mm, right. Mm. So you have to make sure that you empty out your animal. Mm. Uh, unless you have a calf that you're going to put the animal the calf right back on the mother mm. right away. Yeah. yeah. Um, you just got to make sure you just take care of your animals and you'll be okay. Have you, um, during your research and, and, and you know, your, your life doing this sort of stuff, have you been exposed to the other side of like mass production and, and compared how you're doing things to like how things are mass produced? Cause I mean, I've been to, um, cow farms or i don't know what you would call them <laughs> a friend of mine used to work work there and i just seeing how they you know all this machinery that they use and the amount of the numbers of cows they have and it's just like one after another and they're all hooked up and i was wondering if you've just sort of been exposed to that and could tell us a bit about like mm. some of the things that that we're missing out on or some of the things that they've done to cut corners and fast track things you know what I mean? well what they've done is okay so where i live there's this is cattle country. Everybody here is pretty much a cattle rancher. Right. Um, but in the bordering state of Texas and Oklahoma, uh, and even at the, the tip of New Mexico, they have um, feed lots. Mm. And this mm. is where most beef comes from. Right. Mm. Even if it's halal beef, mm. you know, because halal is talking about the slaughtering procedure, not necessarily how it was raised. Right. Yeah. Uh, but there is a movement now, you know, Halawa Tayyibat, which is yeah. like really focusing on the, the welfare of the animal. Yeah. Um, mm. But on these feedlots, they will have hundreds of cows. Mm. There is not a blade of grass in sight. It's just uh, dirt and sewage all mixed together. And the cows are there and they have these long troughs and they feed them grain and mm. they just fatten the cows mm. up, even to the point where... Uh, there was a lot of problems with it. And that's why we had mad cow disease in the United States because they had downer cows. Cows would fall down. They were so sick. They would pump them with antibiotics mm. and they would use um, uh, loaders, you know, backhoes to pick up the cow to take it to be slaughtered. 
Mm. So the animal was like, it was sick. Mm. Yeah. And this got into the food, into the food chain. Right. Um, the same thing with pretty much any animal. Mm. It's just mass produced, mass produced because people want to eat meat mm. yeah. and people want to eat cheap meat. Yeah. They don't want to pay the actual costs mm. that it uh, costs to raise an animal because mm. it's properly, it's not cheap. Uh, and it's not expensive either, but there is a big difference. Yeah. Mm. Um, but yeah, there is a, a, a serious disconnect. Mm. And a lot of uh, people I know, they say, if you're going to slaughter for the Eid, this one person I know, they won't sell animals to you unless you come months ahead of time and you actually take part in the feeding of it and the raising of it. Wow. Because mm. they need you to understand that this is a life that you're going to take, you know, and you need to be involved in the process. Mm -hmm. But uh, with the mass production, um, it's insane. Yeah. Like with, chi with chickens, with egg production, they, they put on lights because chickens uh, lay eggs according to a cycle, which involves the yeah. sun. Mm -hmm. So the more sunlight they have, the more eggs they're going to actually produce. Oh, and they why. actually like burn these chickens out. Mm. Mm. Yeah, yeah. Sharif, I wanted to ask you, you know, you said uh, part of the reason you moved out there is because, you know, to avoid the fitna and the distractions of like city life mm -hmm. or whatever. Um, what about the concept of like, basically, you know, there's, there's a hadith of the Prophet where he said that um, those who mix with the people and, you know, the bad things that come with that are better than those that kind of escape it. What, what would you say about that kind of concept? Well, we haven't completely removed ourselves from the people. Yeah. So um, I'll go back. So before, when we first came, I did a, a search um, and I looked at the demographics of the number of families here. Mm -hmm. So I found out how many households were here, how many married couples who had degrees and all these things. Mm -hmm. And we bought back gifts for everybody. So we bought back chocolate covered dates mm -hmm. uh, for all the households mm -hmm. and uh, a small bottle of uh, perfumed oil. And we went around and we introduced ourselves. Mm. And uh, so we got to know the people like that. Yeah. Um, the people got to know me. Yeah. Um, after a bit of time, uh, I was elected as the vice president of the Chamber of Commerce. Um, so people were like more and more, you know, getting involved. And, um, they just asked me to do a bunch of things. Um, I didn't say this earlier, but I've been doing judo since 1984. So uh, I started a judo school here for the kids. Mm -hmm. um, we just tried to be involved with the community yeah. as much as possible in a halal way. Yeah. And what I would assume out of those people, there's not many Muslims, right? But, but are there a few families that, you know, ah. you know can use it and use the masjid? On, on oh, the, hmm. we're, actively, we're actively recruiting. If you want to come, come. <laughs> so, uh, so I'm here and then on the other side of the highway, uh, we were able to get a hundred acres of land mm. and we split that up. So one family bought 33 acres, another family bought 25, another family bought 20, another family bought 10, another family bought 10. Mm. And that leaves a couple odd acres because it was actually 98 point something, something acres. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Uh, now on the other side of the highway, uh, we have a chance to buy another 120 acres of land. Mm. So if there's any Muslim mm. uh, that wants to live in an area that is relaxed amongst the Muslims, uh, we have options available for you. So they have mm. plots. We're selling 40 acre plots. Mm -hmm. And those are what $35,000. $35, Mm. for a 40 acre plot mm. um one of the people that we have here is um uh khalid green i'm not sure do you know him he has a youtube oh, yeah. channel yeah yeah. Yes. yeah well al Athari institute is based here um, okay so <laughs> like right so, now I'm gonna, I'm gonna look and there's the office it's like uh, that that's crazy right there. <laughs> oh subhanallah okay. Okay. So, I didn't know. So originally when we, obviously I mean said, oh, we're going to have a guest on, but I didn't know obviously yourself, Sharif. I was just thinking in my head, oh, I wonder if it's Khalid Green because the description you were given to me <laughs> felt like that. So I didn't yes, know wow. at all. 
So yeah. uh, Colin, oh we used to work together in Saudi, yeah. and I was telling him about it. And mm. you know, a lot of brothers would come to my desk and look at me like, "Ah, what you doing?" They'd mm. see me looking up cows or Google something. Laugh. <laughs> yeah, and they, a couple of brothers was like, "Okay," but then, alhamdulillah, it came through. Then Khalid was like, "Hey, uh, he travels a lot." He says, "I need a a base, mm. you know, that you know is good for me and my family and everything." Mm. And uh, he came out here, and I been helping him get his solar array established. Mm -hmm. So his his office is just like mine. It's a shipping container that we had spray foam insulated. Um, and we hooked up uh, the electricity and everything for that. And, mm -hmm. you know, doing the same for other people. Amazing. So what? how many Muslim families are there so far then? So that's one, two, three, four, five, six. We make mm -hmm. six. Okay. Uh, oh. And then there's a family that bought land in the village. Mm. They bought two houses there. Mm. So that's seven. Mm. Another one, the deal is in the process right now. So that's eight. Mm. And then we still need three for the plots of land mm. uh, here. And that'll probably be like, when you start having five, six, seven, eight families, probably becomes like more and more proper community, right? Mm. Oh, yeah, yeah. Alhamdulillah. I mean, this, uh, you know, Ramadan where everybody had the social distance, mm. you know, we were actually able to have iftar together and pray together mm. because we're already isolated. I mean, <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. So, mm. And how come you're off the grid energy wise? Can't you just plug into um, their thing? Yes, I could. Mm. But um, why pay, mm. you know, public utilities mm. for something I can produce myself? Mm. I'll like gave um, you the sun for free. <laughs> yeah, I mean, the sun. So right now in my office, I just, I'm using two solar panel, 200 watt solar panels. And I have uh, five batteries on the floor here. Mm. And this is enough energy for me to teach all day and into the night mm. whenever I want. Mm. Um, so with my company, my wife and I, we design systems for people's houses, bedrooms, offices. Mm. We tell you how many panels and batteries or wind turbines you need and what appliances you can run mm. um we pay for it once yeah i never have to pay again and people in the village i went there one day and i saw everybody sitting outside of the general store so i'm like hey and i was walking up i'm like why is everybody sitting out there like the power's off like <laughs> duh and i'm like sorry my power's always on i didn't know <laughs> yeah that's amazing <laughs> uh, what about like uh, water wise uh so water is our only downfall right now. So I, I don't have a well. Mm, so mm. what I have to do is I have to go into town and there's a fill station you can get water from. Right. And they charge uh, $20 for every thousand gallons. And oh, that's cheap, right? Yes, yeah, extremely cheap. And it's drinking water. Yeah. Um, and I was doing that for a while, mm. but my mom, my sister, and my aunt mm. all have properties in town. Mm. and their water allowance is 4,000 gallons a month. Right. And nobody uses 4,000 gallons a month. Right. So I get 1,500 from my mom, mm. 2,000 from my aunt, and 2,000 mm. from my other, uh, from my sister. Yeah. Mm. And I don't have to pay for water. Wow. But uh, we are building a, uh, a rain water catchment system right. uh, to collect rainwater. Mm. Could you drill a well where you are, or it's not suitable? We can, um, the average depth is about 250 to 300 feet. Mm. Uh, and you're not guaranteed you're gonna hit water. Yeah. There is a company that uses seismic uh, technology to shoot a wave through. And uh, that's like $5,000 for them to come out. Right. And wow. then it'd be another $10,000 for the dr uh, well to be drilled. Wow. So we're talking $15,000. Yeah. yeah. And when I was getting water back and forth and paying for it, because they just raised the price, it was $10 mm. for a thousand gallons. I had right. calculated, I could get water for the next 30 years mm. before I would equal, equal the price of a well. Yeah, yeah. So you're not like well. obsessed with being independent because I hear about that sometimes uh, with the homesteader thing, but you're just like, what? it's just practicality basically. Yeah, because a lot of people, um, for example, we don't produce everything that we eat. Yeah. 
because it's not it's not cost effective mm. like olive oil mm. i'm not about to start trying to grow olives and press no it's crazy mm. Mm. uh wheat mm. it's cheaper to buy i mean we get organic stuff uh it's cheaper to buy it in bulk yeah than for me to produce it but for like beef mm. uh oh this is a beautiful deal i had let me mm. tell you this <laughs> so uh we have dairy cows okay uh but beef cows are different they're 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 bigger the mm. muscle is Beef just different yeah, yeah i was gonna say that but i'm like i can't say that <laughs> <laughs> so, they're, they're beefier so uh my neighbor a real cool guy i was teaching his kids judo and mm. i told him you know i wanted you know to raise a steer for me mm. so i said if you ever get one you know let me know he's mm. like okay uh so i was teaching in my office in town because mm. this is before i had my shipping container set up yeah. And I hear this knock at the door. Boom, 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 boom. And I go and I look and it's his wife. And she's like, Sharif. I'm like, yeah, what? She goes, you wanted a calf? And I'm like, yeah. She's like, come on now. <laughs> I'm like, like, what's going on? Yeah. And what, what had happened was the mother mm. when, had died when the calf was born. So, oh, okay. And uh, they're worried now that maybe there's some bad genetics in the calf. Oh, so they don't want to raise it up as a bull. Oh. Uh, also, when they they were pulling it out, which is uh, they they damaged the tendons in its uh, the mm. left front you know leg. So, alhamdulillah, no problem. We can fix that. Some PVC pipe, some okay. duct tape. Okay. So you make a cast, so then it can't yeah. bend it, and it, yeah. it'll strengthen it back up. Yeah. And I raised that. Wow. And I said, how much? Mm. And they said, well. We want milk. Mm. I said, okay. Mm. They said $250 worth of milk. Mm. Yeah. I said, okay. So I would just trade, give them two gallons of milk, mm. you know, every week. Yeah, right. yeah. So yeah. it was $10 uh, for the two gallons. Mm. So 25 weeks mm. of just giving them milk. Mm. Six months, yeah. Mm. And then that calf mm. was in my pasture eating grass and everything. Uh, his name was Young Bull. Mm. Uh, <laughs> and we raised him, and when we slaughtered him, mm. he weighed uh, 1,800 pounds. So that's about, you, you got pounds, or I need to do kilos for you. Yeah, I don't that, know. Pounds. That'll do. <laughs> let me, let me, oh no. Let me get it because people. How, how heavy, sorry? 1,800 pounds. Okay. Uh, mass, pounds. Okay, 1,800. 800. Eight, yeah, kilograms. 820 kilos. Oh! You must have... How do you sort of... Because I, I, I just find it fascinating that you can race. I know it's really sentimental, <laughs> but I'm an emotional guy. <laughs> but you can race it during that. And then, like... Because you, you... Even the way you said it was like, yeah, raised it. And then we, when we thought of it, et cetera, et cetera, there was like, almost like no pause there whatsoever. <laughs> okay. So one of the things that we do, and my kids know it too, so the animals that are going to be slaughtered get different names than the animals that we use as breeders. Right. Okay. So young bull, he's a young bull. He's going to get slaughtered. Young bull, mm. yeah. Okay. He's never going Barbie to be a bull. He's going to stay <laughs> <Yeah>. young. <laughs> uh, we had barbecue. Yeah. Okay. Okay. He was bar. He was barbecue. <laughs> right. <laughs> Just okay. Amazing man. <laughs> uh, but like the cows, because we're the cows for milk. We name them after flowers. So we have daisy, yeah. azalea, primrose. Yeah. You know, they get nice, cute names. Yeah. Uh, the sheep, uh, the female sheep, the ewes, they get nice names. Like, so we have honey, sweetie, honey cup. Uh, but their offspring, mm. the males. Yeah. Like the uh, so we have rambunctious, ramazing, uh, sugar chops. Mm. they're all going to die. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Yeah, man. This is everything that you help people with, with your consulting. Yeah. Yes. You don't want to give an animal a name that you're going to be all attached to the animal and think, Oh no, name it in a way that the children mm. know and you know. Yeah. And, yeah. and the same thing, like my cows, uh, Daisy is pregnant right now. Um, and she's due to calve in September when we come back from our vacation mm. and I'm selling her because I told my daughters that 
we won't slaughter the the milk cows. Mm. So I need to give her or we'll sell her to another family where she's still got a, a lot of life in her good production. I can get a good price. Mm. And we don't have to go through that of seeing her die or mm -hmm. anything like that. Mm. So how many, for a family of like five, yeah, how many cows would you need to get like your daily milk or whatever? For a family? Probably just one. <laughs> you just need one, but mm. cows are herd animals. So you need to have two. If you have a cow by itself, it'd be stressed out. Mm -hmm. um, it, w it will never rest properly because it's always going to be looking for predators. Oh, interesting. So yeah. two animal, two mm -hmm. for cows, horses, sheep, goats, mm -hmm. all these herd animals. Right. Um, but, but one cow, mm -hmm. um, a Jersey, mm -hmm. um, you're going to get between two and five gallons a day mm -hmm. from that cow. Oh, that's a lot. Oh, yeah, that really yes. is a lot. Yeah. And if you had a Holstein, yeah, which is the black and white ones, yeah, yeah. you get twice as much. Wow. Yeah. yeah. So you're getting like 10 gallons almost from a Holstein. Mm. So what do you do with your, you have sheep, right? Do you have goats as well? We had goats, but we don't have them anymore. They're mm. So what are the artists. sheep for? Uh, the sheep, uh, my kids are high end now. They love eating lamb. <laughs> okay. So they're like, Daddy, we want lamb chops. Mm, mm. I'm like, okay. But uh, we shear the sheep. So I have like about nine bags full of wool that mm. I have to get cleaned and processed so uh, we can have it made into yarn. All right. Mm. So uh, that's so, it. That's what we have them for. So, but I'm guessing, I mean, you tell me, like, can you, when you have to buy the sheep every time, you know, you want to eat meat, um, does that mean you can't eat much meat like on a regular basis or? Um... Oh, no, no, no. So what we advise people to do is start off small mm -hmm. because there's going to be a learning curve when you have animals. Mm -hmm. So we started off with uh, three ewes, mm -hmm. okay? And then like uh, we borrowed somebody's ram mm -hmm. because the ram is going to do his job for like a couple minutes. Yeah. I'm not, gonna f I'm not feeding him all year, mm -hmm. okay? Yeah, yeah, so he's yeah. got to go. So... Those three use, okay, mm -hmm. uh, out of those three, there's a possibility of twins. So you mm -hmm. could get six, mm -hmm. you know, offspring right. out of that. Mm -hmm. okay. And then the following year, yeah. when they're old enough, so now you got, out of those six, maybe three will be female. So now you have six uh, for your breeding stock. Mm -hmm. Then you're going to get 12. Out of right. that, you're going to get another six. Mm -hmm. And that's what we've been doing. So, okay. um, so you buy once and then you keep it going. Yeah, I just, mm. I keep breeding mm. and that's it. So mm. Mm. you have enough beef and lamb and mm. chicken mm. to mm. bless you for mm. years. Yeah, I, yeah, yeah. I always wonder this, Sharif, because, you know, people say that, you know, we eat way too much meat and the way that the, the, the cows and the sheep um, are raised, it's, it's completely, you know, unethical, et cetera, right? And so I just wonder, like, if we were to go to a more sustainable amount of meat that we're eating and everything what would that mean like like me now do i eat too much meat or not like if i was living your lifestyle like how many sheep would i need to be you know raising and stuff <laughs> i i wonder about that you know what's realistic and sustainable but you you know how do you work that out well one of the things is uh how much meat do you want to eat like mm. certain some people need meat mm. in order to feel healthy i'm one of those people i, I tried to be vegetarian before mm. it's not working for me mm -hmm. no. i'm just telling you. Mm. it's not working for me not that i don't have uh the energy it's just my body feels completely different mm. uh my wife on the other hand she was a vegetarian i said was uh, mm. for 30 years mm. Mm. and now she's starting to eat meat Mm. Um, and her reasons were ethical reasons because of how animals were raised and everything. Mm. Um, but I believe if we're not looking at mass production and people will start trying to source their, their meat locally, mm. um, the amount of meat that you eat can stay the same. We have enough land and enough area to raise healthy animals and 
actually help the environment, not hurt the environment. Mm. Um, I mean, there are studies out there that talk about the grazing patterns of animals and they actually help reduce wildfires and other things like that. They put nutrients into the soil. Yeah. Um, you have to have a complete loop. Yeah. Uh, for those people who choose to be vegetarian, that's okay, that's, that's great, that's what they do. Mm. But they have to realize, uh, they don't have to, but I advise them you know, to realize that in order to get good quality vegetables, yeah. You need some type of fertilizer going into that. And that's yeah. from animals. Yeah, mm. yeah, yeah. What about... So the loop needs to be a circle. Yeah, yeah. And I saw like in the US when they have these, you know, factory farms or whatever, where they have the cows, they always have that huge pool of sludge, right? And that becomes yeah. like toxic, basically, right? It's just uh, yeah. concentrated in one place too, yeah. too much, basically. It's nasty. I, I actually drove by one of the feedlots. And I'm telling you, I was, I don't know the exact distance, but I was miles away mm. and I could smell it mm. miles away. Mm -hmm. You know, mm. it was just, it was terrible. Mm. Yeah. Um, what about this then, Sharif? I have two eggs every single day. I've been doing that for like six years, maybe. Right. So how many chickens do I need? Okay. So, Basically, what you need is depends on the breed. Mm. Okay, mm. so a chicken will typically produce one egg a day, mm. uh, roughly for about two hundred and sixty days. They have a, a molting process. Okay. A molt is when they lose their feathers, mm. so they don't produce eggs because their energy is going into producing new feathers. Right. Mm. Um, so yeah. So basically. In, in my house, what mm. we say is three chickens per family member, so we have enough eggs mm. for eating. You could do mm. two, yeah. Uh, but if you do three, because one, you might drop an egg. Mm. This and the chickens lay eggs at uh, not the same exact time every day. It actually moves an hour later. Wow, Subhanallah. So I guess you need to know, like your fiqh pretty well living out there. <laughs> yeah, well, actually, uh, you do because yeah. if you're living off grid uh, yeah. or if you're just a farmer, mm. there are different things, you know, like were these crops irrigated mm. or was it natural rain mm. or was it a combination yeah. of a, cow, yeah. It's a, you know, a fiqh issue yeah. or how many sheep do I have? Do I have 40? Do yeah. I have 39? Do I have 60? What's the zakat, you know, uh, yeah. on these things? So, yeah, if, it actually opens up another branch of Islam that, you know, many people don't dabble into. Mm. Oh, of course. Yeah. Wow. Amazing. And, and what about then the actual, you know, fruits and vegetables side of things? Uh, what do you do there? Uh, well, this year, mm. um, it's, it's been really dry this year. Mm. And it just started raining. Our rainy season is June, July, August. Mm. But it was like really de like delayed. Mm. Uh, and we were planning to go to UK. So we didn't plant a lot this year. Mm. Um, but normally we would try to plant uh, zucchini, um, uh, whatever type of leafy greens, salad mix, uh, tomatoes, potatoes. Uh, we watched this special uh, from the BBC, um, mm -hmm. Victorian Farm. I don't know if you've ever, ever seen it. It was a great special. They have a whole series. Mm. But they grew these uh, mango wurzels. These are like giant mm. uh, root vegetables. Okay. I mean, they can get like like huge. Yeah. Uh, people can eat them, but they also use them for uh, feeding livestock. Mm. So we tried to grow those uh, corn, mm -hmm. uh, strawberries. We grow strawberries inside and outside. Okay. Um, blueberries, goji berries. Uh, recently, we planted 50 trees. Mm. So we planted... Um, uh, Arkansas black apples, um, Nat King cherries, um, some wild plums. Yeah, those. Mm. And we already had the apricot and Santa Rosa plum. Mm. And you, you water them just from the rain or you also have irrigation? Or No, we're actually, we're using a deep mulch method. So we put a lot of mulch to mm. help retain the water. So there, first there's like a little bit of a basin yeah. and the mulch. Right. And then we're going around and watering. Um, especially in the first year mm. uh, of a tree's life. You have to really water it so it can get established. Mm. Then what you try to do is you 
you wean it off. Uh, mm -hmm. Because if you keep watering it all the time, the root system doesn't branch out like it needs to. Right. And you'll have a, you'll have a weak tree. Mm. Um, so there's a, a, there's a balance in between of giving it enough water, but making it fight to spread its roots out to look for water. Wow. That's like, I guess the same for kids, right? You gotta, uh, yeah. you gotta wow. make sure they have enough challenges to actually grow. SubhanAllah. The, the, exactly. These are the types of things I would expect to get from, uh, being in touch with nature is that you start to draw these analogies and these, uh, links between things. Did you find that? Oh yeah. So like in nature, there's, there's a perfect balance. Mm. Okay. So, uh, here we have snakes. Mm. Okay. There are four types of snakes that are common here. Mm. So there's a gardener snake, there's a whip snake, there's a bull snake and rattlesnakes. Mm. Okay. Rattlesnakes are dangerous. Mm. Okay. If, uh, you get bit by a rattlesnake, you got like three at three hours to get the any venom in you or you could possibly die. Mm. Um, the bull snake is big. It's intimidating. It looks like a rattlesnake, but no rattle. Mm. And the pattern on it is a little bit different. Mm. Uh, as we're speaking, mm. I don't know if he's there right now, but I have one that lives under my shipping container, under my office. Okay. Uh, I step out. I see him. <laughs> Salam alaikum, bro. I call, him <laughs> Billy, I call him Billy the bull snake okay. because he's, wow. he's my friend oh. because they kill rattlesnakes. All uh, right. Okay. So you need to have that balance. Mm. Yeah. Uh, yeah. Like bats. I have two bat houses. I got to put them up. Mm. Um, but bats, they eat mosquitoes. Mm. And, you know, mosquitoes carry malaria, what's now. I mean, all these other things. Mm. Um, so you want to have them. They don't attack people like people seem to think. Mm. Um, they're out there getting the little mm. pests that, you know, you don't want around. Yeah. Um, there's just everything is in perfect harmony. Mm. Ladybugs will eat the little other uh, pests that are trying to eat your plants. So you want to mm. have ladybugs in your garden. Mm. Uh, wow. Marigolds. You plant mm. flowered marigolds and the smell, rabbits don't like this smell. So they stay away from your garden. Mm. Wow. So you don't need to have pesticides and all these things. There's so many things that you can do naturally. Allah yeah. has given us everything that we possibly need Yeah, is right here. Yeah. yeah. That's crazy. So, so you wouldn't say it's like really, it's a big struggle to do the whole organic thing and stuff. No, no, no. It's, it's easier than you think. I mean, mm. you have your, say for example, we have our cows. Mm. Okay. So they're dropping the manure everywhere. Okay. Mm. All that is, is processed grass. Mm. Yeah. Yes. Yeah. That's all it is. Uh, once you've been out here and you've been doing this, First, you'll pick it up with gloves. After that, you'll be like, you're picking it up bare hand. You don't care yeah. anymore. Yeah. Uh, yeah. Now, because we, we know that, you know, alhamdulillah, that we could pray mm. in the, the, the pen of the sheep and the cow and the goats. You know, there's no problem. Yeah. So uh, you use this. It's a free source of manure. Why would you go and spend money mm -hmm. and you have something that's even better? Mm -hmm. Of course. Mm. You know, mm. it's like, you know, it's like Bani Israel. They wanted all that other stuff mm. and they had what was good for them. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So we don't need to go and get this extra stuff. So organic uh, is an easy way to go. It's not expensive. Um, it's not perfect. You are mm. going to have some pests that are going to come and get some stuff. But you can make your own things. Um, apple cider vinegar mm -hmm. with some cayenne pepper, mm. you know, and a little natural dish soap. Mm. And you can spray that on your plants. Mm. Stay, keep them away. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. Mm. Mm. You know? So, so you know, uh, you mentioned the, the vegetables and fruits you have. Does that, mm -hmm. how much does that cover you for like what you eat? Is that like 50% of what you eat and you buy another 50% or what's the mix? No, it's not, it's not 50%. We're not at that stage yet mm. um, because it's not cost effective for, you know, what we're doing and everything. Yeah. Um, next year, though, I mean, the plan is for next year for it to be at least uh, 50 percent and 100 percent on some things mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. like, for example, potatoes. I want to be covered 100 mm. uh, percent of my potatoes, mm -hmm. you know, mm -hmm. because there's there's no reason why I can't be. 
Yeah, yeah. Uh, 100% of my carrots, 100% of my tomatoes, 100% of my corn, uh, 50% of like uh, salad mix because the salad is going to be seasonal. Mm -hmm. uh, but like other greens that you can eat in the winter where you can't grow the salad mix or like kale, collard greens, mustard greens, um, rhubarb, you know, things like this. Mm. So we can grow those at uh, the colder times. Mm. So, so like, 50 to 100% is my mm. realistic goal. Mm. That sounds good, though. Um, I was going to ask you, um, so yeah, because you mentioned like some different ways you kind of earn a living um, out there. Mm -hmm. What if you wanted to go like all in on the farming? Would you need like a lot more land? Like how would that look if you wanted to do that? Well, I, I've never really thought about doing that as a, a full-time business. Really? Um, I'm trying to be semi-retired. Mm. Um, I want to be able to take care of my family and our needs. Mm -hmm. yeah. um, and we said, if we have any extra, then we will sell. Mm. One of the things that we do when we, we do plant is we do times four. So we take what our family needs are and multiply mm. it times four. Okay. Um, the reason I do it that way is if we have a very dry year, uh, times four should give us exactly what we need. Yeah. And if we have a good year with you know, good rain and sunshine, mm. I have surplus and I can sell. Mm. Um, the goal has always been to be self-sufficient, to take care of us. Um, uh, right now is a perfect example. We got the coronavirus and everything mm. and people haven't been able to work. And a lot of people lost income. Mm. Um, they've had to resort to borrowing money, selling money, uh, relying on the government for stimulus packages and you know other things like this. Yeah. Um, it's because our mindset has changed. If we go back to, let me see, man, to the forties mm -hmm. in the UK or the US, mm -hmm. people had like family gardens and they would actually plant vegetables, you know, for their own consumption. They would have yeah. maybe a, a chicken or two. Mm -hmm. And we've left that because um, we live in cities for the most part. But even if you live in a city, you can still get that back. You can have a container garden in your window. Mm, yeah. um, I said, I grow strawberries. We grow strawberries in a hanging pot. Yeah. Um, they have stackable gardens. You can grow different herbs and vegetables there. Mm. Um, you can grow microgreens. Microgreens are ready in 10 days. Yeah. So yeah. there's just so many things that you, you can do even in an apartment or a limited space. Mm. Mm. So I think if we change our mindset mm -hmm. and think, you know, hey, well, one, this is sunnah, you know, to be doing this. And then two, it's, it's good for us because fresh fruits and vegetables, they just have a different taste. Yeah. Uh, and also it's a skill that it's being lost. If we don't teach this to, you know, our children, we're at the mercy of other people. Mm. And, you know, if they decide tomorrow that an apple is $50 or 50 pounds, Mm. Or, you know, there's that 50 dinar, we got dirham. Dirham in UAE, yeah. Yeah, mm. yeah, 50 dirham. Mm. You know, you'd be like, man, <laughs> what am I going to do? Yeah. Mm. You're at their mercy. Mm. Yeah. Do you think your so, kids are going to stay living this lifestyle? Um, I believe so. Like, I, I, I give my children the option. Um, as I said, my kids are uh, dual nationals. And I asked them, do you want to live here or do you want to live in the UK? Mm. And they're like, no, we'll just go visit grandma and granddad. You know, yeah. they, they like it here. Uh, they have a lot of freedom, mm -hmm. um, especially my daughters. You know, being a, a Muslim uh, in the city compared to being a Muslim out here, they can run, they can play. Mm. And uh, my son, he even says when he goes to like, you know, uh, his grandfather's house, he likes it, but he doesn't like it. And I'm like, why? He goes, because I can't yell. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Because, you know, you, you have neighbors. But yeah. here, yeah. I mean, he's out screaming and going on mm. little different adventures. Yeah. Uh, nah. so. <laughs> it sounds great, man. I can imagine growing up with, like, so much space, motorbikes, yeah. cows. Yes, yes. What's the youngest yeah. age, do you think, 
um, you, you know, a child can slaughter sheep? Ah, uh, hmm. I don't, I don't, they have to get over their fear. So for example, my son, he's seven, mm -hmm. but three, four years ago, he assisted with the slaughtering of chickens. Yeah, 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 yeah. So, he assisted. I didn't let him do anything by himself. Mm -hmm. um, my daughters, I I want them to slaughter, but they're like, nah, daddy, go ahead and do it. They're not scared. Yeah. Because Good. my one daughter, when it's after, you know, we slaughter and then we're, you know, spl uh, slicing the belly, she'll reach up in there mm -hmm. and grab the esophagus and it's, you know, mm -hmm. it's not an issue. Mm -hmm. um, I think I'm, I might just have to just say, no, I'm not doing it. Yeah. And just, and they're like, oh, I got to go to the post office and leave. Yeah. Uh, <laughs> to like, to force her to do it, you know? Yeah. But, um, yeah. yeah. Mm. I mean, sometimes we got, you got to just put them in a situation where they have no choice. Right. Yeah. yeah. And that's what happens, I guess. Like, I guess they, they mature quicker out there because there are those circumstances where they've got to do it. And they have, they have their roles, you know, like you said, your daughters milk the cows. Like mm -hmm. a lot of the time in the city, what is your role? Like, I don't know, taking, you know, getting your cereal out of the cupboard. <laughs> you know, it's not real. Like, <laughs> yeah. Uh, yeah. I mean, they actually, uh, it is different. Um, they, they grow up. I mean, I'm a believer in everybody is doing the same stuff. Like, I don't care that my son is a boy. He's going to learn to cook. He's cooking. Yeah. Okay, and my daughters cook. And mm. um, actually, my, my one daughter was in the hospital for like a week, and my wife had to stay with her. So my other daughter uh, was with me and my son. So I come come home, and I'm getting ready to cook. She was like, Daddy, what are you doing? Yeah. I'm like, what do you mean? She's like, I'm cooking. <laughs> and, and she, I'm like, I can cook. She said, no. I mean, mm. she got really angry with me, like, mm. I'm not allowed to cook. Mm. Yeah. And, I mean, alhamdulillah, she's an excellent cook. I mean, they've been cooking since they were like, whew, like four. Mm. Yeah. Wow. It's fun, so, so do you, do, do you, I get everyone has a role. Do you like give certain roles to the boys versus the girls or is like everyone does the exact same or how do you think about that? Like gender wise? Uh, gender is that's not important. It's just age. Mm. Okay. You know, mm. so like my son, uh, two years ago, mm. uh, when he was five, he started learning to bring in the cows. Mm. and starting to milk when he was we five do, yeah so we do hand milking and we do machine milking okay um so everybody in the house has to know how to milk mm. because if, if the girls get sick or something they have to be milk yeah. if i'm a, i'm away they have to be milk so everybody mm. has to know mm -hmm. every role mm. Mm. how would you how would you advise somebody go about thinking if this you know is the life for them where to well, start sort of thing, yeah. Yeah. There are many things uh, that I suggest to people. Mm. First, it depends. If you're going to go off-grid or you just want to live in the country and still have all the utilities that you have. Mm. If you're going to go off-grid, I tell them to start at home reducing your energy usage. Okay? Mm. Uh, start making things from scratch. You know, stop buying this processed and convenience foods and things like that. Mm. Um, so, like, how many people, you know, in your audience mm. know how to make bread? Okay. Mm. <laughs> how many? So, like, my wife. In does. my, I don't. I, I don't. I don't. <laughs> <laughs> Come on, bro. You gotta, you gotta learn how to make bread. Mm. Yeah. So, like, yeah. so, and everything. Okay. Another one, pasta. Mm. Okay, spaghetti noodles. Mm. Mm. I mean, we make spaghetti noodles. We can make pasta wow. here. Great, yeah. yeah. Uh, but how many people rely on the store? So yeah. my advice would be start doing as much at home as you possibly can with your energy mm. usage, uh, with your cooking, uh, and start learning. Mm -hmm. Taking trips in nature. Mm. Go camping. Mm -hmm. uh, go for a weekend. Go for a week. Mm -hmm. uh, different situations don't just go when it's sunny mm. because when you're out here uh homesteading i mean mm. it's been raining it's been mm. snowing you know although we don't have snow all the time but 
you got those days when it's just like you wake up and it's like it's freezing out there. I do not feel like you have no choice. Mm. Yeah. Mm. The animals come before you. Like I tell the kids, the animals eat before you eat. Mm. Yeah. Mm. Because That's... without the animals, you don't eat. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. yeah, yeah. These are like lessons they learn without you having to lecture them. It's just, it's there right in front of them. The just natural way of living, right? Uh, and so what about like income wise, right? Because I'm thinking, obviously you don't, you're not a farmer full time, like you said, right? Mm -hmm. You've got other source of income. So would you say if someone wants to move out there, they need some kind of a source of income that's online or because I'm guessing there's not too many what you know jobs you can do in a, in a small village right or what, right. what about that well what you have to do is either work online so remotely mm. or start some type of business yeah uh so i have another business i mean you could be like this guy's doing everything but i'm st i just started another business mm. so we have uh these beautiful uh can um canyons mm. so rock climbers come from all over the world mm. they say that this is the, it was the second best. Now they say it's the best place for rock climbing in the world. Mm. And it's, it's right here. Mm. Um, we had people come from New Zealand, from France, all of the United States, yep. UK. Uh, now in the canyon, there are mountain lions. Mm. Okay. Mm. Rattlesnakes. Mm. Awesome. They're, predator, they're predators in there. Yeah. So these people go there and they, and they, they camp out in little nylon tents. Right. Mountain lions just coming right through that. Right. So yeah. um, I got some, I use British terminology, some caravans mm -hmm. that uh, I'm renting out to people. Right. Um, I'm still in the process. I'm like repainting and cleaning them up and everything mm. uh, to rent out to people. Mm -hmm. uh, also the, the crash mads uh, pads that they use. Mm. I'm going to rent those out because mm -hmm. some of the climbers said when they travel, so if they're coming from New Zealand and they got to bring their pads, each one of those is an extra piece of luggage. Right. So that could be like $50 for each one. So they might spend, you know, $100 to bring them out. Right. Where they could just rent them from me for like $10 a day. Mm. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Mm. So they can, mm. you know, relax mm. a little bit. Mm. And the yeah. same thing for four walls around them. Yeah. Yeah. So business is really the way to go, whether it's online or local kind of stuff. Just depends where you're living, I suppose. And yeah. then you can also trade stuff, like you said, um, the, the calf for the milk, et cetera. Um, oh, people here, they always trade. Yeah. Um, it's like one of their, their big things. I even traded uh, the same guy, the cow that mm. we got the calf for. Yeah. Uh, I needed a tractor. Mm. Okay. Mm. So I traded judo lessons for the tractor. <laughs> Amazing. That's amazing. <laughs> That's amazing. <laughs> and, and I guess, you know, when it comes to like, obviously I've got business, which is kind of, uh, you know, online based as well. And okay. what I'm thinking is that if I was to live like in a rural area, like I wouldn't even need to make much, like my business wouldn't even need to do that well for me to live. Right. Mm -hmm. Like what's, what's the kind of, cause you're in the U S obviously there are places elsewhere that are way cheaper but you're still you know it's cheap way where you are relative to like cities and stuff what kind of you know extra income would do you need to pay for the you know the olive oil and the stuff you mentioned that you can't okay uh, get? so i have to pay for my internet service because yeah. I, I teach online so i have to have good internet service mm. so my internet bill is 70 dollars a month mm. right okay um i need a phone <laughs> plain and simple Mm. Um, and then my wife and my kids have phones too. Mm. Um, so that's enough. That's 160 a month. Mm. Let me, let me just add this up. Cause <laughs> never even. <laughs> He's going to see where he can sh shape some prices yeah, now. Do some cuts. <laughs> so, somebody's somebody's going to get their phone service cut off here in a second. <laughs> so, okay. So we got, man, why is my phone so slow? Okay. Oh no. Don't tempt yourself into buying something better, huh? Okay, so, can. <laughs> um, I'll use British terminology, so petrol. Mm. Okay, so okay. <laughs> don't want to confuse you if I say gas. So, so my petrol, uh, because of my truck, um, and this is a it's a work truck, so it's yeah, it's big. 
Yeah. Uh, I'm spending at a minimum, mm. I'm going to say $200 a month. Okay. At a minimum. Mm. Um, I could shave it off more and, and do certain things, but we'll just leave mm. it there. Mm. Uh, okay. Propane in the winter for heating. Um, I, I can use wood because we have wood stove also, but propane is, I don't feel like getting up in the middle of the night to put wood into the wood stove. I want to mm. sleep through the night. Yeah. Mm. Um, so during the day we use wood and you can use propane at, uh, through the night. Mm. Uh, the propane cost, because that's for heating and cooking, is about $70 a month if we average it out for the whole year. Okay. I think, I think that might be right, about mm. 70. Mm -hmm. um, there are certain things that we just can't grow or it's not even cost effective. Mm. Uh, I'm gonna put that at about three hundred dollars a month. Okay. I guess the most expensive things like uh, is meat, which you don't need to buy, right? Now we can do that ourselves. Yeah. So if uh, I'll just right now I'm at eight hundred dollars. Mm -hmm. Um, I would say at a thousand dollars is what I need uh, as actual money mm -hmm. to be able to do the things that I mm. need to do. So twelve thousand dollars a year. Mm, that's like 800 pounds. That's nothing. <laughs> With family of yeah. five, mashallah. Wow, great. Cool, man. <laughs> what are you thinking, yeah. Muhammad? I'm thinking, uh, <laughs> I was thinking Tunisia, of, yeah? Yeah, I was thinking of Tunisia because um, it's, 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 it's interesting that he, you know, Sharif mentioned about how Tunisia is like, it's, for me, it's got what you've got. At the moment, like that opportunity is there for me, really, because okay. I live in such a rural area and I can literally start any of that. And I'm not paying rent or anything like that. However, it's the combined element of, well, there is that risk that religion might not be the country's priority, you know, or there might be issues and that kind of thing in terms of practicing. So it's like, do I live, continue living here and be, you know, distracted and, and chasing Stuff where you can't even think about Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala sometimes because you're so caught up in the dunya. Whilst over there, you've got plenty of time to... And actually, you know, it, it reminds me that you, you taking back control allows you to to make that decision on how religious you want to be, if you know what I mean. You can... Yeah. If you, here, you you know, or at least in the West, or general living, general sort of living. I keep saying in the West, like you're not living in the West, but really, <laughs> really you are. But, you know, <laughs> in, in the West... In the, in the what we what we what some people call the traditional lifestyle now, which is just I don't know nine to five thing it, um, you're sort of yeah you're you're almost enslaved to others and you're you're working for others and you're working for things that you may never see you know like you mentioned uh, was it your sister I believe just pumping yes. money into a mortgage that you may never see the light you know um, or or surrounding yourself with people that, and it's interesting that you've surrounded yourself with like-minded people, but when you expose yourself to people that are after the, you know, big houses, nice cars, and, you know, suited and booted all the time, then that becomes what you think success is, you know, surrounding yourself mm. with that. And I think changing your environment, especially so drastically, can do wonders for your family. So yeah, that's the sort of stuff I'm thinking about. I mean, I know, I know, Amin's always spoken about like um, trying to get into uh, a settle in a place where there is this community element. And I think that's probably something that really appeals to Amin at least. I don't know if he wants to talk about that, but it's definitely. Uh, what do you think, Amin? Is that something that really appeals to you? That kind of community element of. Well, for me, it's like I'm just wondering because um, on on one side. I think in rural settings, uh, communities are closer, right? Right. Yes. Uh, people know each other well. They even rely on each other a lot of the time, right? Um, so mm -hmm. that will bring you closer. But then there's just the number of people is less dense, right? Yeah. Um, but I don't know if that makes a difference. Maybe it doesn't make a difference, you know? Like London has 10 million people. Um, and, you know, your village, Sharif, has like 600 people. But you probably know a lot more of those 600 people closely than you would if you lived in London. Do you think that's true? Oh, yes. They actually have um, a calculation for this. Mm. Um, so they say when you 
uh, establish a purposely built community. Yeah. It should be 150 or less. Once you go over 150, you need to break off and establish a second community. Mm. Now let's look at the 150 number. Okay. Yeah. So if we take 150, uh, we're just going to use some rough estimates. I know if there's some statistician on there, they're going to be like, brother's numbers were off. Just yeah. bear with me. <laughs> so 150, half of those are male. So yeah. 75. Right. Okay. Out of those 75, uh, how many people have to pray? Okay. So we'll just take, say, maybe 30 of those are, have to go to the masjid. I can know 30 people by name. I can recognize if, you know, for slot, if somebody's missing mm. with 30 people. Mm. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Even 50 people. Mm. Um, so it allows your community to, to know one another. And uh, you have the, the manpower to get things done. We're building a house. Um, one of the things that I learned, you know, from where I was when I was little growing up, you know, near the Amish, because I did work on their farms mm. uh, as a teenager, mm. is they come together and do everything together. Mm -hmm. um, I'm not sure if you're aware, when a couple gets married, the whole community comes together and they build their barn in one day. A yeah. huge, wow. you know, mega yeah. barn. Uh, if uh, they don't have insurance, uh -huh. if somebody, if something happens, everybody just comes together and they pay for it. Yeah. Uh, it's just, if your horse is lame, you go to your neighbor, you borrow his horse to get work done. Mm. Their, their community is so tight knit that it's the, my wife likes to call it, it's the, the non-Muslim sunnah. They're following yeah. our sunnah. Mm. Yeah, you know, yeah, definitely. Yeah. In a way that, you know, we aspire to. Mm. No. Uh, do you have insurance, uh, Sharif, for anything? Like sometimes you might have to have to have it or no? Uh, the state of New Mexico, well, mm. yeah, the state of New Mexico requires you to have mm. uh, health insurance. Yeah. But if you don't have it, they provide it. Oh. <laughs> okay. <laughs> And, so yeah, because yeah. it was weird when I came back from Saudi uh, one summer. Um, this is uh, when I was doing immunizations. We don't do immunizations anymore. Mm. Um, so I went to the clinic to have uh, one of my kids immunized. And I was like, what's the fee? Mm. And they're like, what's your insurance provider? I said, I don't have insurance. They're like, no, it's illegal for kids in New Mexico not to have insurance. And I'm like, oh, Okay, what am I supposed to do? Mm. They're like, fill this form out and the state has to provide you insurance. I'm like, okay. Why? <laughs> <It's laughs> you just never got it. <laughs> yeah, just like, okay. <laughs> well, and, and so what if you're like, you, you said you have a tractor, right? What, what if that breaks down? Oh, you know, I borrowed a tractor. Like yeah, and then you just save up to fix it or something like that. No, it's not mine. I, I just borrow it. Oh, you borrow it. Right, right. Yeah. yeah. All right. Uh, yeah. Like, I was just wondering if you have anything, I guess you, you're still a s Muslim wise, you're still a small community, but eventually you could do something like the whole cooperative insurance setup, right? Yeah. There are many, there are many things that are great benefits for Muslims in New Mexico. Mm. And this is why I'm trying to get more people. Uh, so for example, you were allowed to actually establish your own village, legal village. I can actually, mm. we call our area Andalusia. Okay. Okay. So we can legally break off from the rest of the county, mm. establish Andalusia, mm. get money from the, from the state government mm. for, uh, for police and medical like service, like ambulance, mm. uh, collect taxes. Mm. Uh, and, uh, what is it called? We'd be an incorporated, uh, I can't remember the term that they use, mm. but we can do that if we so desire. Mm, yeah. what, what's the criteria for that? You need certain population or? No, not really. Because the area down the road from me, that's about seven miles away. It's called mm. Solano. Mm. There are, I think five or six families there mm. and they're their, okay. they're their own village. Okay. So if any so of the awesome. listeners want to get involved, maybe can you let them pick the name of the, of the village? <laughs> Street names. To, to tempt them Andalusia. 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 With, with the land of the Muslims. <laughs> Maybe it gets big enough. You have little streets and that people can bid on street names. Oh, but, <laughs> oh, I, about the street names. So yeah. 
my property uh, doesn't have highway access. Right. So I'm illegally allowed, and I already went, I can get a, uh, a permit to have a road put in, and I can name the road. That's mm. awesome. So my road will be Abdul Qabid Road. My family mm. name, Road. Mm. Mm. People awesome. will know Muslims were here. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Amazing. That's awesome. Make it, look, look it up on Google Street View, yeah? <laughs> yeah. Because all, all the other families have done it too. So yeah. there's like Baca, which is a family name, Mahoney, yeah. Wiley Stauffer, all these family names, you can name it after yourself. Yeah, yeah, yeah. What about like That's healthcare cool. wise then? You mentioned, you know, your wife was in hospital one time. Is that far away? Oh, my daughter. Your daughter, yeah. Uh, yeah, how does that work? So the hospital, the closest hospital we have is 80 miles. So it's uh, an hour and 15 minutes to get there. Mm, wow. um, she has a condition, uh, GERD. So it's a, a digestive acid, you know, uh, issue. Mm. Um, alhamdulillah, we were able to get that uh, sorted out. We mm. had to go to another hospital in Albuquerque. Mm. And um, the specialist, nobody would listen to us. I mean, alhamdulillah, my, we research everything in my yeah. family. Mm -hmm. And uh, we knew what it was, but the doctors weren't listening to us. Mm -hmm. So when we went to the other hospital, uh, a specialist came in who had used to teach, excuse me, used to work in New York and she's from uh, Jordan. Mm -hmm. Okay. So when she, when she came in uh, and her profile says she speaks English, Spanish, and Arabic. Mm -hmm. So she comes in to see my wife and daughter and she's like, you know, Arabic, English, English, Arabic, you know, she's asking them in all the languages to find out, they're like, yeah. we speak English. Yeah. So she was the one that listened to us. We told her the thing, the condition, and then she goes, yeah, your daughter has GERD. Right away, no problem whatsoever. Mm. Yeah. Uh, finally got somebody that would listen, got the proper treatment, and alhamdulillah, my daughter hasn't had a, uh, an issue in, what, a year and a half now. Alhamdulillah. Alhamdulillah. So I guess there's a, a lot of the minor things you might have health wise, you kind of just, because it's like an hour, et cetera, away, you might just be tempted to sort it out yourself. Right. Mm. Yeah. I always tell my kids, my son, cause he's always climbing and jumping and mm. oh yeah. man, he gives me nightmares. I'm like, look, 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 Shoaib, we don't have time to go to Alta Vista. Cause that's the name <laughs> of the hospital. <laughs> we don't have time, man. We don't have time. <laughs> Subhanallah. Alhamdulillah. Subhanallah. Sharif, um, maybe we'll wrap it up soon. But I wanted to ask you if there's anything you miss from like living the urban life. The, the only thing that I actually miss is, uh, it's going to sound kind of crazy, but you know, like restaurants. Mm -hmm. Yeah. You know, to be able to go and get, uh, certain things like I'm from Pennsylvania, Philadelphia area, cheese steaks. That's mm, like yeah. our thing. Mm -hmm. I can't get one unless I make it. Mm -hmm. yeah. uh, pizza. I can't get real pizza unless I make it. And we do. I got a pizza oven now. There you go. And you know, I got my halal pepperoni. I got everything. And you know, same quality. Took mm -hmm. a lot of practice, but mm -hmm. yeah. you know, it's there. But to be able to just go get it is something that I miss. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. yeah and my you know our mutual friend the, the, uh, my friend that put me in touch with you he said that because when he told me about you i was like isn't that like so difficult and it would take you years to learn how to do it and then you'll be up at like 4 a.m every day and you'll be working till like 4 p.m at least and he's like no no this guy's chilling <laughs> <laughs> so, yeah, so yeah. how does that work well <laughs> you just got to <laughs> do the research yeah. and put the right things in place. So for example, uh, my first class is at six o'clock. Yeah. Uh, I teach two classes for, you know, six mm. o'clock or seven o'clock class. I take an hour break mm. this hour in between there. If I need to run around here on my farm and do something, I have an hour to do it. Mm. Uh, it might be, I need to get water to the animals or mm. whatever it may be. Mm. Then I come back and I teach for two more hours. Mm -hmm. Okay. Then I take another hour break. Mm. Can run around, do whatever I need. Mm. Then I teach for two more hours. Mm. So then I'm finished teaching by two o'clock in the afternoon. Mm. 
Mm. Okay. Uh, during the day, the animals, there's not a lot of work to do. Mm -hmm. You milk the cows twice a day. You can milk once a day, or you can milk three times a day. Mm. Two is pretty much the standard. Mm. Um, the cows aren't stressed out, and you don't have to work too much. Mm. Uh, collecting eggs for chickens is once a day. Mm. Yeah. Uh, the sheep go out by themselves. Um, we had, I just got rid of them, but I got to get new ones. We have livestock guardian dogs. Right. So they're great, they're great Pyrenees. Um, these dogs will fight mountain lions. They'll kill a bear. Um, you know, they, <laughs> they, imp um, they imprint on sheep. So basically the sheep think that the dog is a big sheep and the dog thinks it's there to protect them. These wow. dogs have been doing this for 6,000 years. Yeah. These are, these dogs aren't pets. Mm. Um, they were born in a field with sheep. Mm. Um, they've never been in like a vehicle, um, uh, wherever the sheep are, they are, they sleep in the barn, they sleep in the snow, they do whatever. Wow. Um, uh, my neighbors have lost animals, but we haven't lost anything. Alhamdulillah. Alhamdulillah. Mm. Um, so my animals take care of themselves. Uh, and I, I plan stuff out. So major water runs I try to do on the weekends or Thursday when I finish teaching. Mm -hmm. yeah. So I finish teaching at two. I have a water Buffalo, which hauls, uh, like 500 gallons of water. Go get that, fill up all the animal troughs. Um, mm. uh, then go and get, uh, I have the switch tanks, uh, for household water. Mm. And then I'll be done for like a week mm. uh, with water wise. Um, and then we just relax. I get on YouTube. <laughs> <laughs> Learn more stuff. <laughs> Do more research. Yeah. Get on YouTube. Think about this. Think about some crazy idea. Mm -hmm. uh, answer the brother's questions because he'd be sending me questions on WhatsApp. So, <laughs> yeah, yeah. Yeah. So you're uh, like safe to say if you want. Yeah, and you could be done by like 3 p.m., something like that. Yeah. Mm. I mean, I could actually be done early. I could, if I wanted to, schedule all my classes and not have those breaks in between. Yeah. Uh, but the, the break, it's better for me. I have more energy because when I teach, I want to give my all. Yeah. Uh, and if something comes up, I, I have that hour where I can go and do something. Mm. Um, but, uh, yeah, the mm. idea when we started this was not to be working – super hard to be able to relax. Mm -hmm. um, even my kids are homeschooled mm -hmm. um, and their, their school is like relaxed. And we even incorporate certain things from the farm, like biology class, you're living biology. Mm. Um, my daughters have delivered animals, mm. you know, assisted in crazy stuff. Girl had a sandwich in one hand, was helping the lamb deliver with the other hand. Oh. Um, it's just like, <laughs> I love it. You know, yeah, yeah your, your your mind changes and you know like it's not like ew no it's just yeah. like okay come on uh, yeah yeah so yeah things change uh, but mm. i mean i think it was it's been really great for the kids mm. they've experienced so much and you know they do know how to function in society and the city and everything and uh you know education in the states kids go to school until they're 18 Mm -hmm. uh, my daughter finished at 16, yeah. you know, did she, she do like in. the SAT or whatever? Uh, no, she, we have this called the GED. Mm. So it's the equivalent of a high school, um, mm. diploma mm -hmm. to take that exam. Mm -hmm. And then, uh, you can go to university. Mm. Awesome. So, uh, she took it, she passed it. Uh, she actually scored, um, high enough in one particular subject where she would actually get credit at the university level. Mm. Um, and then I asked her, what did she want to do? Mm. She wanted to basically take a year as a break gap year. Mm. Uh, so she's going to start her university studies uh, when we come back from the UK in August. Mm. Inshallah. I got two, two quick questions, Sharif. Yeah, random ones. Um, I heard, I went to a farm in the UK, yeah? Willowbrook Farm. Maybe some people oh, know it. I heard, I heard about it. Yeah. So the brother there, uh, Lutfi, he told me he's got llamas to protect his sheep from foxes. Mm -hmm. Have you got something mm -hmm. like that? I mean, I guess you got the dogs, right? Yeah. Now, yeah. There's, you can use different things. You can use llamas, mm. alpacas, yeah. donkeys, 
Mm. Now, all of these animals will protect uh, your livestock. Mm. But the, the problem is that a llama, a donkey, and an alpaca are only capable of fighting one predator at a time. Mm. So, and with these three animals, they're no match for a mountain lion. We have mountain lions. Yeah, yeah, not foxes. And, <laughs> <laughs> yeah. <laughs> so we have mountain lions and bears. Wow. But dogs yeah. actually can fight, one dog can fight multiple predators. Wow. And I had two. Mm. So each one of my dogs, the Great Pyrenees, um, can actually patrol and protect. Mm. One can patrol and protect 50 acres by itself. Wow. So I had wow. two, so it was even better. Mm. And my dogs are nocturnal. Mm. Um, and they work in a team. So during the day, one will sleep and one will patrol mm. naturally. I, wow. I law create them this way. Allah and then they'll take turns. Allah Allah. Uh, and they are the only dog when they did testing with the American Kennel Association that it didn't snap uh, on its handler. Mm. These dogs are super docile to their handlers. Wow. So with my son, when he was little, he was scared. I said, no, you have to be the alpha. Mm. The dog has to know you're in control. Mm. Mm. So when he got scared, I told him the dog was coming at him. Was like, I told him to smack the dog. Mm. Let the dog know that you're in charge. Mm. And he did this and the dog see him and they, they, they put their head down like in, in reverence, like, okay, mm. he's in charge. Mm. Mm. I love so it. it's just, it's a natural thing. Sometimes, yeah, we talk about that on the podcast, Sharif, like, uh, for example, something like hierarchy, right? It's so mm. basic in nature. But yet, uh, in 2020, people want to question having hierarchy at all, right? They, they, because they're so disassociated from nature, they feel like they can have a household or a city or a country without hierarchy. And it just, anyone who is connected to nature at all knows it's impossible. Um, no. Yeah. No. And finally, uh, what about ostriches? Is that something that's good to have on a farm? I've eaten ostrich meat when I was in Saudi. Yeah. Um, I've never had even the, <laughs> the desire or even thought about having them on my farm. Okay. Uh, I thought about having camels because uh, we have camels in Texas, mm. uh, which are, they get them from Australia because they're a nuisance animal there. Yeah, they sell them right. in Texas. Mm. But uh, ostriches, I never thought, they're intimidating. <laughs> they, are. Mm. they are aggressive i heard yeah but i heard yeah. one egg can feed 12 people <laughs> yes but those eggs take so long to cook yeah okay oh okay interesting yeah i watched the thing they, they were cooking an egg mm. and uh it was huge and it took a long time to cook yeah it's so, mm. okay sharif muhammad do you have any parting questions or words or anything um oh yeah i just plug plug your blog and stuff i really want to oh, yeah, sort of check that stuff out definitely uh, do you know what can you share okay. your blog with us what is what sure. do we look for so the blog is uh healing earth blog dot blogspot dot com okay i'll put that in the description as well inshallah and uh yes, there'll yes, be a link there so you can just click that and uh, by the way, Sharif, you know, I know you're an English teacher because you speak so clearly. Mashallah. Very clearly. <laughs> <laughs> maybe for an American. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, maybe. <laughs> you said it, not me. <laughs> Mashallah. Jazakallah khairan, Sharif. Honestly, it's been, uh, I right. think the right word is fascinating. Um, maybe it's just yeah. me. I'm interested in this. But I think, you know, Muhammad, you enjoyed it as well, right? And I think oh, everyone's man, yeah. gonna... this is definitely one of my favorite episodes. Yeah. 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 I mean, I just, I just hope that uh, this sparks interest amongst other people, mm -hmm. uh, especially Muslims, because we really need to start thinking differently. Mm -hmm. You know, we can be in the cities, we can be there, but if we don't have a presence in agriculture, mm -hmm. we're just going to be dependent mm -hmm. on people. And we see this every year for the Eid when somebody wants to get an animal to slaughter. And the prices skyrocket because they know that we need them. Mm. Yeah, yeah, mm. yeah, yeah. It's fun. Amazing. So yes. May Allah put barakah in all of your work, all of your uh, um, crops, your livestock, all the work you do, mashallah. And inshallah, you know, you'll find um, more and more people coming to take part in your community and uh, 
you know, buying up those lots and inshallah, growing, uh, growing and growing, inshallah. Uh, great. Inshallah. Thanks everyone for listening. Uh, remember to go to mindheistpodcast.com if you want to ask any questions, give feedback on this episode or any of the other episodes, inshallah. And uh, yeah, we'll end it there. Subhanakallahumma wa bihamdika. Shadu wa na ilaha wa anta. Astaghfiruka wa tuwa ilaik. Assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh.